So Randy, thanks for joining me again on the podcast. Remind everybody who you are and what you're up to currently. Well, my name is Randy King, as it says on all of my branding, and I am a, uh, I'm an education-based self-defense instructor. So that's kind of a switch from what I said last time I was on the show, where I was more of a reality-based self-defense instructor, mm-hmm. and I still am, and I still right. teach physical skills, but uh, I'm really leaning more towards the education. One of my favorite quotes is, education, or sorry, technique takes time, education is accessible now. So mm-hmm. Uh, In my opinion, I really like all the feedback I've gotten from the countless people I've worked with. The biggest feedback has been uh, the education stuff is what helped them, not really the physical stuff. So Mm -hmm. I made a slight pivot in my company. I shut down my gym here in Edmonton. Um, Everybody was very sad for me. They thought it was COVID related. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, My business partner decided to leave. He wanted to do other things and he was the person running the gym. I was traveling for two years. I didn't even know what the place (laughs) looked like, to be honest. Uh So... Uh, decided to shut her down, which is good, converted to more of an online model, doing hybrid training in person and online. And we opened a new brand called 8020 Conflict Management Strategies. And that is, it's 8020, but not the Praetor rule 8020. It's mm-hmm. 8020, 80% education, 20% physical response. So oh, like that's the new branding. We have a slick new logo, website and stuff coming. Uh, and we're going to focus a lot on educational based classes, training but also physical skills, right? Because unfortunately we can say all day that this education is going to help, but sometimes the rubber has to hit the road and you need to get physical. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I'm excited for you. That, that sounds awesome. Thank you. Wish you the, uh, the best of luck. And one of the things that you want to talk about with your new business Mm -hmm. is what we're talking about today. And that is boundaries. And this is, this is new for me. I haven't really talked about boundaries on this show before. So, you know, in in preparing for it, I was trying to think of what kind of boundaries do I have as a person? And the funny thing is the first thing that came up was I just don't want somebody to sneeze directly into my face. (laughs) That was, And I think, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Right. You know, I, you know, so like, I, I, I think I'm one of these people that has boundaries. I just don't ever think about them and I don't acknowledge mm. them. I only know when something's kind of sort of gone wrong. So right. am I, am I on the right track here? That's, I think that's the normal response that people have is they, they kind of have this, some people confuse boundaries and preferences a little bit, but a lot of people, when we're, when we're looking at this, a boundary is just something is just, the way you tell the world how you wish to be treated, right? Mm, so, okay. you know, don't use this word when you're near me. You know, you don't, don't speak to your father like that. Uh, don't go on the street or spanking will happen. Like these are all uh, enforceable boundaries. And I know we have like a whole plan to, to walk this out, but I think you're right on the right track. I think a lot of people don't think about them. And the problem is people only think about them when they're breached. Mm-hmm. And if you only think about something under pressure, then you're going to underperform in that situation. So the same with physical skills for self-defense. If you know, if you, you know, you think you're going to see red and just start swinging and you're going to be invincible. And then when something happens, if you don't perform the way you're going to perform, that's going to hurt you physically and probably emotionally down the line. It's the same thing with boundaries, right? If you don't think about your boundaries, you don't set those boundaries like uh, consciously, then when somebody violates them and you didn't know they existed, it's going to be very hard for you to have an appropriate response to then reinforce that boundary. Honestly, to me, the more I do this, and maybe because this is where my eyes are looking at right now, uh, but to me, boundaries are the beginning of self-defense. If you don't have boundaries, all the rest of the stuff is pointless. Like I've talked to so many people in the industry, so many uh, victims of trauma, and I hear a lot of them say like, well, you know, my body's not really mine. I've been abused X, Y, Z times. So people can do whatever they want. I'm like, whoa. So this isn't a choke, kick, punch problem. This is Mm -hmm. a learning for you to set boundaries problem. Absolutely. And what I hear you saying is if you set your boundaries and you understand where your boundaries are, it helps you to be proactive in protecting yourself and keeps you in a proactive mindset instead of a reactive mindset. Is that right? Correct. That is 100% correct. So like literally with everything, preparation is the most important part of any one of these situations. I use airplanes a lot as my example. I might have said it last time on the show, but uh, it bears repeating. There's a reason why they do the safety dance at the beginning of every single flight you take, right? They show you the exits are. They show you where uh, the places to go. Make sure you know the eggs might be behind you. Everybody hates this. They hate it because it's pointless, but... All the stats have shown that even one, even one repetition of visualization of going to an exit will pop up under pressure. 
the mm-hmm. more time humans have to prep, the better they're going to respond, right? Like some people, you can have unlimited time and still make a poor choice. And I'm not saying that the more choices equals perfect decisions, but I'm saying time equals safety, right? The more time I have to make proper decisions, the better off I'm going to be. And literally, if you don't have a boundary setting strategy or an idea of what your boundaries are, when somebody violates it, it's very easy to just go physical right now Mm -hmm. because you didn't even know that was going to happen where this could have been stopped with a check. And also when we talk about, when we talk about self-defense, the way I talk about self-defense, so not just what's up, bro, somebody took your parking spot kind of stuff, but we Mm. look at predators and grooming and uh, child victimization, all of those things. It's always the people with low or totally permeable boundaries that just people can walk through that tend to get selected for victimizing. Yes, I cannot agree with you more. I, that, that is spot on. With people who have low self-esteem and low boundaries, those are the people who get picked out. So, exactly. All right. So preferences just and, and boundaries seem like this big jumbled mess. How do, we, how do we sort these things out? Help me out here. I think preferences are boundaries, to be honest. Like this is, again, this is the Randy King. Like somebody called me the Tony Robbins of self-defense. So I'm like, raw, That's raw. That's a great You're- compliment, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it actually, uh, I think Tony Robbins is kind of a predator, to be honest, but I get what they were going with. Here. Yeah, I, yeah, a, okay, yeah, I get I'm it. I'm not a All fan right. of Tony Robbins. Tony, okay. if you're watching the show, which would be crazy, shout out Andy. Don't right. shout me out. I don't like it. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm all about like everybody like understanding like your your opinion, what you believe is important. Like, obviously, there's going to be places where this this bounces against culture, this bounces against uh, where the world is moving. But you you need to establish your boundaries under your own uh, thought processes, right? Like I can't tell you how, like Andy, I can't tell you what your boundaries should be. I don't know, mm-hmm. right? Because I don't know what your family, yeah, what your family life is. I don't know what anything about your life. Is. So for me to say like use Randy King's boundaries for yourself isn't going to work. Again, the same way it's, it's stupid for a coach to be like learn how to fight like me when they don't look like you or your size mm-hmm. or your weight or your whatever. Right. So self-defense is always to me about the client. It's not about the system or the coach. So the client needs to understand that everybody's boundaries are going to be different. Some people might be okay with leaving their door unlocked and having strangers walk into their house because of where they live. And some people might not. So you need to really sit down and figure out what those boundaries are and put yourself in various situations. And we, we I know we're talking about this later, but we separate, we separate boundaries in a couple of different categories. You need to look at each category and decide like where my boundaries are here. This has been, especially the clients that I work with, because again, I work with a lot of people that experience trauma and really bad events. This is a game changer. This is bigger game changer than learning how to hit fucking harder. You know what I mean? Like it's way better to, to have these, these verbal, emotional, physical boundaries that you establish and make sure they're repeatable and enforceable. That's going to do so much more in your life than learning how to kick and punch. Learning how to kick and punch is good. It's good for physicality. It's good for confidence. But, you know, if your only resort is a sick rear naked choke, that's going to be mm-hmm. weird when the HR manager at work isn't liking your work, right? So, so we have to look at your situation as a human <laughs> right. being. <laughs> right. Okay. And, you, you know, you talked about there's a category and we'll go through them. You know, give us yeah. the quick list of what all kind of boundaries there are. So the, I'm sure there's more. This is uh, this is a, a goon gone goods version of boundary setting. I'm sure if uh, like a PhD psychologist will probably have some more layers of this. But personally, for me, there's three levels of boundaries that I talk about. So number one is your physical boundaries. That's your standard self-defense stuff, right? Put up a fence, passive stance, sniper mode, whatever cool branding you're using. Then uh, there's verbal boundaries. And that's how people speak to you, what words are allowed. You've experienced this with your parents, most likely, at least parents of a certain generation. I don't know sure. if the millennial yeah, parents are quite the same yeah. thing, but yeah. So, um, and then emotional boundaries are, are the most important one, the least talked about because number one, uh, emotions are icky. If you're a guy, like we don't have those. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. We don't have one of, of course we would never mm. have emotions. That's no. crazy. Uh, and also with women, it's hard to deal with too, because uh, women don't want to be seen as over emotional. So talking mm. about their emotions also is a problem. So we have these uh, biases, right? So whether it, and it doesn't matter where you land on the spectrum of uh, gender at all, you're going to have your own biases of why you don't want to express your emotional boundaries. Right. Right. But those, those are by far the most important. And when we talk about it, when we talk a little deeper on this, so whether here or in the course, um, emotional boundaries are because you're so ignored, 
they're the easiest to override. So a predator, it's way easier for them to override you emotionally. If I can beat you emotionally, I can beat you physically, verbally, no problem. You could have the best physical skill set in the world, right? And now this is my example for the three batteries. Maybe you're a really good technician. You know how to fight, elbows, chokes, whatever. And then, but somebody, you, can, you don't like the, the F word. So somebody mm-hmm. drops an F bomb in your face and that freezes you, then doesn't matter how good your physical skills were, they're going to beat the crap out of you, right? Right, right. Same thing with the emotional thing, right? So if me just making you uncomfortable puts you into a freeze or a frightened fawn state, then all that training you did goes out the window. And I've seen this mm-hmm. happen so many times where uh, somebody feels uncomfortable in class and they stop training, right? And that's good. Mm-hmm. You should do that and tell your coach, but we also need to, to, to work past these. So the emotional boundaries is where I focus most of my attention because it's the least talked about version of boundary setting. A lot, every single martial system has a physical boundary setting strategy. The good reality-based, education-based, self-defense stuff have good verbal strategies, but very, very few people talk about emotional ones, which is weird because it is the easiest one to override, and that one will supersede the other two boundaries. Hmm. Okay. All right. So let's let's start at the beginning of your list here. So tell sure. me about a physical barrier and how that gets violated. So there's, we can look at this uh, micro and macro, macro being the world, micro being you, but the fence on your house and the mm-hmm. door lock on your door are physical boundaries, right? Sure. So, so those are the first ones, right? Those are your first layer of protection is the external protection, right? I don't really focus on that. That's what you do. That's what the Secure Dad podcast is for. That's right. For. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so th- those are very important facts, right? Having your locks, et cetera, security systems, whatever. Those are physical boundaries. Um, but then we have our personal physical boundaries. Those could be putting up a stance, putting up a position. It could be using a tool to keep distance, swinging a stick, pulling a firearm. All of those fall under physical boundaries. But that's a very tactical look at it. I'm going to look at it more from a personal view. Physical boundaries are how you like to be engaged physically. Now, this could occur in your sex life. This could occur in your regular life. This could occur with how you deal with children. They're very important things. So like notoriously uh, on the internet, I've been outed. I don't like hugs. I'm not a hugger personally. I just don't <laughs> mm-hmm. like them. I'll hug you if I know you, but like these, I do a lot of seminars. I meet a lot of people. This hugging every human is just, it wears me out. I don't like it. My own weird trauma. So mm-hmm. uh, that's one of my hard physical boundaries is, hey, I don't like being hugged. Like if I choose to hug you, I will, but mm-hmm. don't just assume you can hug me. And right. I hate when, and so this is the biggest uh, boundary challenge that I get is, huggers get the default win culturally so Mm. if somebody hugs you and they're like well i'm just a hugger you're like but i'm not a hugger why does your boundary beat my boundary and that's the personal preference but it's true huggers tend to win this culturally i look like the bad guy when i'm right please don't hug me why don't you want to hug anybody randy what's the problem i don't know you (laughs) (laughs) so that's an example of a physical boundary right maybe it could also be uh somebody at work saying you know don't like don't touch my lower back when you go by me. That's inappropriate in a workplace mm-hmm. situation. These are all physical boundaries. So a physical boundary is how you relate to the world and the limits you're putting on that. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So you gave um, a great explanation a minute ago of about verbal boundaries. Like, you know, if the mm-hmm. F-bomb freezes you up, something like that. Somebody says something that's just so completely outrageous that it locks you up. So. Right. You know, I I'm really until our conversation here, I didn't realize that verbal boundaries were really that important, you know, because I kind of think, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never right. hurt me. But that's not necessarily true, right? I, I, I agree. And especially culturally, as words become more and more important, and most of our conflict is happening online in chat rooms, mm-hmm. not in physical <laughs> space. Right. Uh, the, the verbal boundaries actually become more important so the the way i scale them is uh, a reverse important scale right it's a reverse alpha ladder i put what i think the least important one is first which is physical because everybody covers that but verbals is a really big deal um for a couple of reasons number one if, if i could control you emotionally or i could control you in any way i could control you physically right so verbal boundaries are a great way to lead to breaching of emotional boundaries so let's say you have a jump board everybody has jump 
And what I mean mm. by a jump word is a word that said that instantly puts you into an emotional state takes you out of that calm, zen, human brain, kind of puts you to more of a tribal survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, my, favorite, my favorite jump word is, and so I don't want anybody's feedback on this. I'm just going to say the word. You don't need to comment on it, but Trump. Trump is a jump. <laughs> it's, it's just a jump yes, word. Yes, it, it is. Matter. It has become, it yeah. Matter, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter where you stand. If I say the word Trump, boom, we're hitting emotional <laughs> brains here. Just instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my big... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I see exactly what you're talking about. It is it is a, an emotional trigger for some people, you know, because some people love Trump, some people don't. And it really is and it is and it means so much more than just the just the name, just the president. It means yeah. cultural differences. Yeah. Like and, and and people have made it that way. Whether or not it actually started that way or not, our society <laughs> has made it that way. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good I was really kind of getting scared. I was like, oh my gosh, what word is Randy gonna say? <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut this thing off. But no, <laughs> but yeah, like okay, yeah, that that makes sense to me. I get that now. I'm sorry I derailed so, you. No, that's totally fine. It's impossible to derail me. Only I derail me because of ADD. So uh I so I have a story actually, if we have time for it, mm -hmm. about my old jump word. So when I was bouncing, so from 18 to 24, I'm sure everybody's heard me say at least once on a podcast if you follow me, uh, I wasn't great. I wasn't a great human being. I was mm -hmm. a very heavy child, like 350 pounds heavy guy. Mm -hmm. uh, then I lost a bunch of weight and under all that fat was a decent looking face. So girls started <laughs> talking to me and I became kind of a, I became exactly every person I hate right now for about five to six years of my life. Uh during that time, I was bouncing. I was picking every fight I could pick. I was under instructions from the doorman, the head doorman, sorry, bouncer for everybody not in Canada or uh, England. Doorman also means bouncer here in Canada and in England. Uh, I was, uh, the head bouncer said, our job was to fight everybody. That was my first gig. Your job uh, is fight everybody. I'm like, okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> I was 19 and invincible and I was sure. lean now and girls like it was a good time. So anyways, I noticed that there was one word that, cause sorry. As I kept going, I decided that I didn't want to fight everybody. People don't punch the smiling doorman. This is where my smiling security course comes from. I've taught it in eight countries, the different bouncers and doormen all over the world. Um, but I had this word that would always make me throw punches. And it was the word goof. Now, the word hmm. goof, when I was coming up in Canada, meant child predator. So hmm. I, didn't, okay. I didn't like... I didn't like being called that. It was like a jail slang kind of situation. Sure. So when people called me goof, I would lose my mind and fight them. Um, that's not appropriate in a civilized society <laughs> to have right. one word hook me so emotionally to get into this fight, right? That's not great. So what I did to establish my first verbal uh, desensit desensitization boundary was I told all of the hottest waitresses in the bar. So if you haven't caught this, everybody, I'm a cis heterosexual male i like women um the i asked every hot woman i could meet to try to to randomly call me goof all the time because mm -hmm. number one i don't hit women unless they are training as a warrior then you're a warrior i'll beat the crap out if you want me to but if you are a woman and you're not trained i just have this cultural thing that i don't i'm not going to hit you just i'm not going to do it sure. so when a hot girl called me goof i still got me up like but mm -hmm. i was like okay calm down and i learned how to mitigate that boundary on my own so this is that the problem with boundaries is you have to do your homework. You have to find your own glitches and hooks and trigger words. And I bet you all of all of you have one. Um, obviously, I'm going to use the N word. I'm just going to say the N word. I'm not going to use that word. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had a, I have a, a guy that still works with me. He was on my I used to run a security company as well. I own my own event security company. And he worked with me. We were up north in Alberta. And up north in Alberta is as white as the snow. Like, and there's not a lot of diversity up there. Sure. Uh, and he is black. So a person called, dropped the end bomb on him. But thanks to the training we did, he didn't get the emotional reaction the guy wanted. Because mm -hmm. all he wanted was for a person of a different descent to swing on him. So we had the justification sure. to fight back and tell that story. But it didn't work out that way because that hook word didn't work because luckily we knew about the training at that time. So I'm not saying don't be offended. I'm not saying people should ever use words like that against you. But don't let somebody who you wouldn't take advice from, opinion, don't let that person's opinion mess up your whole day or lure you into something. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Absolutely. I hear what you're saying because some people 
they they don't physically throw the first punch. They verbally throw yeah. the first punch. The, I can bait you. And I think law enforcement has to deal with this every single day. Every single day. Because they want somebody, you know, to, they want to say something to a cop and that cop yep. goes off and they get it on YouTube and it goes everywhere. And it was just a police officer trying to do their job. They get triggered in a high stress situation. And the next thing you know, their uh, household name for the wrong reason. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. If, if you can think about, and, and, and I'm learning from you, you know, here in real time that the first punch or the first salvo in a conflict doesn't have to be physical. It can be verbal. Yeah. Unless it's an ambush, which is statistically mm -hmm. rare. The odds are the first shot's going to be verbal and whether it's domestic abuse, whether it's somebody, they're going to mm -hmm. test your boundaries. You're going to see what's there. Very few things are just a beating out of nowhere. It does happen. Don't get me wrong. But sure. People really take the, the verbal aspects out of it. Going back to what you said about police officers, this is why my heart goes out to them. They have a very hard job. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm going to, this is not the same thing, but like people forget that what, what you think is interesting or what you think is unique, or what you think is special is somebody else's everyday event. Right. Mm -hmm. So so like, if you're like, hi, I told that cop off, you're going to tell that story to your grandkids, most likely. You're going to be the tough person, right? So, right. but this is what police get every day. Same thing with bouncers. Like, I remember when I was bouncing, people would pick fights with me because they only have to fight me once. If they fight me once and win, they get a story to tell forever. They beat up the bouncer with this bar. Or if they lose, they get a story to tell, but then they never have to do it again. Mm -hmm. And they think it's just one thing. But to them, it's one thing. To me, it's every a-hole with that thought process right. is doing the same thing thing so mm -hmm. there's a volume that collects so people take things very personally especially when they're the person that makes they're the straw that breaks that camel's back right mm -hmm. so it's happened 85 times you're 86 86 was the limit and then something happens now oh my god there's this brutality situation and again i'm not saying there isn't issues i'm saying that this is a problem because everybody thinks they're special and unique and clever, right? And you're not. You like when you go to the store and you tap your debit card or whatever, use your Visa card, and it says, you know, like, oh, service isn't working. You go, oh, it must be free then. <laughs> you think you think you're clever, but the cashiers heard that 57 <laughs> times that day. Right? So, so again, this is kind of where those right. verbal boundaries are. Understanding, like, flipping mm -hmm. the script and looking at other people's viewpoints. Right, right. Yeah. And or even sports teams to a certain extent, like everybody sure. wanted a piece of the Chicago Bulls in the 90s and the Lakers right. in the early 2000s. Oh, hey, we beat the Bulls or, you know, I outscored Michael Jordan in a game. You know, Michael exactly. Jordan had to like fend people off every single night because they were trying to topple him because he was a legend exactly. in the making and we were all watching it. So, yeah. Dan, Dan, Dan Inosanto has a very good quote with this. Okay. And the quote is... uh it's a football quote. It says the only person in danger in football is the person with the ball. Right. Mm. So that's an important thing. Like if you're the person with the ball, if you're the person of high rank or status and everybody's coming to get you, you're the, you're always in danger while you possess that ball. And until you lose that ball, you're always going to be in trouble. That's bouncers, police officers, anybody with some kind of vested authority, military coaches, uh, Michael Jordan, right? People are going to try to make us, it just takes once. It just takes mm -hmm. once to topple the undefeated fighter. It just takes once to, to stop that Michael Jordan in his tracks, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I really want to hear your thoughts about emotional boundaries because you, you started off with, and some things clicked for me. If you can control somebody emotionally, you can control them verbally, and then you can control them physically. And that is, I have seen in my personal life, how predators get children. And yeah. specifically and how predators can pretty much try to take over anybody who has those low boundaries like we've been talking about. So yeah. where do we where do we start in understanding our emotional boundaries? So we already know them, but we probably push them down, right? So there's that mm -hmm. person at work that pisses you off, but you ignore them. Or there's the creepy office massage guy that <laughs> likes to touch you and uh -huh. you ignore them, right? Uh, every, there's, I think... What people need to realize, and this is maybe the salesman in me, so this might be a bias, but everything is a negotiation. Everything. Mm -hmm. I always want my way. The person I've talked to always wants their way. And so we're going to always be negotiating for the thing that we want or the thing that they want. And so this is why, it's, this is why we change from self-defense to conflict management. Because conflict is physical, verbal, emotional. It, it's, a bigger, it's, a, it's a bigger fish to fry. And 
all conflict is in the basis of two people trying to get their way, right? That's, that's what it is. Whether I want to, like, if I want to arrest you and you don't want to be arrested, that's conflict, right? Mm -hmm. If I want a promotion and you don't want to pay me more, that's conflict. If I want to touch you inappropriately, you want to be touched inappropriately, that's conflict. And somebody's going to win one of these. Now, this, we talked about it a little bit with the verbal stuff. And I really want every, all your listeners to understand that this isn't like a one, two, three thing. This is an integrated strategy. You, sure. need to have, yeah. you need to have all of these things integrated, right? Because if, let's say, for example, if somebody hugged me and I lost my mind and started punching them, that wouldn't be okay either, right? right. So even though I'm using a physical battery, it's, that's an emotional thing. And it's all kind of ties back that emotional state. So emotional boundaries are the hardest to suss out because they're the most mercurial. They're hard to discover what they are because you have to really, you have to really analyze your day and what makes you uncomfortable. Like, does your mother make fun of your weight and that bothers you? Does your father want you to be tougher? That that bothers them, right? So we need to look at all the little niggles in our head that trick people into like into into making rash decisions. Now, mm -hmm. when you look at these, like domestic abuse is an amazing one. I shared on my social media. Um, this video of a police officer. It was like a TikTok where a girl walked by in front of a record of an abuser and the abuser walked by and was like, get back together, my talk's ex. Like that's an emotional hook. That person has an emotional hook in that person, whether the emotional hook is sexual in nature or, or comfort in nature. But we find the people who have the weakest emotional boundaries are usually the people with number one, the weakest sense of self. Number two, the weakest uh, boundaries in the other areas. And number three, the they have no really good cultural connect so maybe not a good family life not good support structure so when people used to ask me what my biggest tip for self-defense was i'd be like oh you know at a uh, situation where it's pay attention now my biggest tip for uh for self-defense is have a strong support structure know who you are as a person have enforceable boundaries everything else gets easier because you've probably had people on the show where they're like you know i've never really run into anything bad but i still put these things up and mm -hmm. it's one of these, it's a very, it's a catch 22 self-defense, the same thing, right? It's very hard to sell a service when the result of the service working is nothing happens. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So you're like, mm -hmm. okay, I've invested all this money into like security cameras and blah. Nobody's ever even tried to rob me. And you're like, well, right. they didn't try to rob you because you have security cameras. So it's, it's this weird catch 22. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the emotional boundaries, getting a more like definition of it. it's they're the things that make you jump out of that brain. The second, a good indication that a, a emotional boundary has been violated is you're feeling some kind of emotion, any emotion. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be good or bad. Like, you know, uh, I don't know if you were like this, Andy, but I was, uh, I dated my, I dated my share and a few other people's share of ladies when I was younger. And every time I remember every time, every time I felt something for them, I was like, like this was not the plan right so so that that was technically a break of an emotional boundary you have to look like this too sometimes it's good if your goal is to be single and that's your emotional boundary and then the perfect partner strolls in that's a good violation of this boundary because now you have this perfect partner um but like i said it's very hard to suss up because everybody's gonna have very different emotional boundaries right mm -hmm. what 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 makes you feel uncomfortable what kind of uh, what kind of vibe do you get from people, right? Because a lot of people like to mm -hmm. squish down their natural instincts, right? Your subconscious tells you that's what um, intuition is. Your subconscious communicating to you faster than your conscious brain can process that something bad is going to happen. They, we tend to shut that down. And because we don't listen to this, your brain almost becomes a pouty child, right? So if you're not mm -hmm. going to listen to me, then I'm not going to tell you. But the more you listen to it, the more your brain starts to tell you what is happening. So Emotional boundaries would be something like, um, uh, so I'm in my training space right now. Uh, I like to have the door closed for a lot of my training sessions, but some people maybe want to have it open. That would be an emotional boundary. I feel uncomfortable if you lock me in here. Same sure. thing in my, pod, in my podcast studio, right? Uh, I sit in the corner and everybody else is free. I don't pin anybody in when I'm talking to them because I'm a, I'm a bigger than average fella. So if I sit in between you and something and I don't want you to go, probably not going to go. So I like to set up those kind of things to make people feel comfortable and safe. So emotional boundaries are your comfort level in situations, right? Are you comfortable in a uh, social situation? So I'm an extrovert. Clearly I can't yeah. stop talking. Uh, <laughs> my, my fiance is not, she's an introvert, right? 
So her emotional boundary would be, okay, we're going to go to this party, but we have to leave by 10 and maybe peep without by then. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, that's cool. And then, then we start discussing our boundaries. I'm like, well, I won't be people though. Do you want to go home? Do you want me to drop you off? Can I come back? Because everything's a negotiation. I want my way. She wants her way. And we got to find that nice middle ground. Very cool. Very cool. And I think, you know, the more you talk about the emotional boundaries, um, I, I think that sometimes there are bosses and supervisors who try to be your friend simply mm-hmm. so that they can manipulate you into working later or longer or doing their work share for them. And I'm pretty sure that 80% of the people listening to us in this podcast right now have either had a boss like that or is currently had uh, having that boss. So oh, yeah. what, what would you suggest when, you know, somebody really comes in and they pose themselves as a friend as like this Trojan horse strategy to get in and, and really try to manipulate you to do something that you don't want to do. How can we respond to something like that? So we're going to move into talking about uh, a full boundary setting strategy. So physical, emotional, verbal combined. Uh, almost everything needs to be communicated verbally. Uh, and I really want your listeners to understand that your uh, boundaries are like a castle. Hmm. You need to ha- it needs to be uh, strong enough to keep out the bad, but permeable enough to let in the good, right? Okay. A castle with just walls and no gates, people inside are going to starve, and uh, a country with no walls to get invaded all the time. Hmm. So I talked about in the course boundary injuries, and we'll maybe talk about that later. Uh, I want to answer your question now. But this is where people's boundary injuries kick in, right? So maybe they're over compliant or they're not compliant at all, right? So, like, you know, they're going to hate everybody or they're going to allow everybody to take advantage of them. These are issues. So, number one, if you don't know that about yourself, you're probably going to be at least on the selection side of things, right? Mm. And I want you all to understand that. You can't choose if you're selected. The only thing you can choose is how you get deselected. That's Mm. the only thing you can do. So you don't get to pick when you get stalked. You don't get to pick when somebody decides to mug you, but you have to have all the protocols in place to become deselected. So don't worry about getting selected. Just worry about getting deselected as fast as possible. If you have normal uh, boundaries, you come from a good uh, cultural background, you have good, and when I mean culture with family, I don't mean like countries, sure. uh, but like, yeah. you know, you have strong connections, you have a pretty good sense of self, the odds of this happening to you are going to be low because you're going to stop it in its tracks as you know how this works. So usually it's only people that don't understand boundaries, boundary setting or setting limits on anything. So that's all a boundary is, is a limit, right? It's, mm-hmm. This is where this extension is going to go to. And that's the end of it. And after that, we stop. We have to enforce that boundary and really have to reinforce that boundary. That's a whole nother topic. But when, uh, when you have that boss that comes in, number one, if, if you notice they didn't ask anybody else to work late, but they're coming at you to work late, that's a check on yourself. Like, why did they pick me? Oh, because, you know, I keep telling everybody I'm single and I always work late and I'm ambitious and, you know, I have nowhere to be. So, of course, they're going to pick me. So, maybe they're picking you because they're just trying to do their job, right? Maybe this isn't toxic at all. They're just like, eight of my employees have kids under two. You're single. Who am I going to ask to work late? Mm -hmm. Right? That's just how it works. Now, is that fair? No, but that's just kind of life. If you notice in your entire life, you're always the person who's either always giving or never receiving either side of this kind of boundary injury thing, this is, this is taking a look at yourself. Now, uh, I would love to say we could fix the world in a podcast. And these are all the ways you could do sure, this. But sure. a, a lot of this is self-reflection. I very, very much fall on the, if you take care of your house and I take care of my house, we'll all have nice houses yep. kind of thought process. Yep. So that's your first check, right? It's realistic. Like, why am I always the one that gets asked to work late? Now, if this is a new thing, it's a bad boss. There's predatory cues. There's threat markers, all these kind of things that pop up. Um, and those exist, right? Like sociopaths exist. They're, they're around. They're just yeah. horrible people. Yeah. Narcissists exist. They're, they're out there. So uh, the first thing is, if you already have strong boundaries, like my favorite example is the office bitch, right? Mm-hmm. So like, Oh, don't talk to Karen's the name that everybody uses. So yeah. let's don't talk, don't talk to Karen. Karen won't do anything. That just means Karen has the best boundaries. Like she mm-hmm. gets to go to work and just do work and no, and doesn't have to like make cupcakes or come in early. Like go Karen, you're kind of <laughs> killing it right now. Right, right. Right. So, so when it comes with men, men are assertive, but women are bitches. And that's mm-hmm. an unfair cultural shift. 
that we need to kind of look at. But I think, again, if you have strong boundaries uh, and you know what those are, so you know, like, I have to be out of here at six o'clock because of these reasons, but you also have the permeability to be like, but I also want a promotion. So I will allow myself to work late once a month or once a week or whatever. Then once those reasonable boundaries are set, if your boss is trying to violate them, that then becomes a problem. Very good. Very good. Good, good, good altogether explanation there. And I hope somebody, hope people listening to this are going to, going to take that away and really do some nice thinking about themselves and about why is it me and all that kind of stuff. All right. So I think we kind of stepped into this just a little bit with my last question, but what are some ways that people with bad intentions can really manipulate our boundaries to achieve the goal of hurting us or getting oh. something from it. I know that's a huge question, but like, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, kind of walk us through a scenario if you want to. So let's look at violence and kind of in general, and let's look at how people access high level violence. So there's only four ways that people, there's probably more. We teach four, I don't want to say only, because then I'm like, in the comments, oh, there's actually uh, eight ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. four ways I talk about that people access violence. So number mm-hmm. one is extreme emotion, right? There's a reason why murder one and murder two are different charges, right? Right. It's yes. easier to under it's easier to understand, like, oh, you walked in, your husband was cheating, and you you beat the crap out of him. I get it. Mm-hmm. Right. But cold-blooded murder, it's hard to get because the emotion isn't there. So we have extreme emotion. We have operant conditioning or training that allows you to access higher levels of violence. So military training, police, martial arts, that kind of stuff. We have social conditioning. You grew up in a bad neighborhood violence was always a tool that you use everybody used violence and then you have what's called othering and othering is making somebody not like you and this is why mm, okay. i'm really i'm really big i'm really against any kind of hate speech in any form and i understand that speech is protected and that's good but right. hates hate speech is a way for people to condition their brain to hurt somebody more mm-hmm. there's a reason why military agencies let people who work to true or deployed overseas take three weeks off at a really cool place so they can get reacclimated to society right yes because the yes. mindset you need to be in there is not a good mindset for the culture we have here mm-hmm. so when we're looking at othering that's one of the ways that people access higher levels of violence to not get othered you want to put yourself in as many groups as that person exists in, right so if i'm a sports mm-hmm. fan you want to be a sports fan if i'm a dad you want to Dad, right that puts the same group this is hostage negotiation 101 all of this comes back to the normal reaction if you don't know this or have this kind of training is emotion how dare you say i'm like this how dare you typecast me in this role that i don't believe i'm in mm-hmm. um this this is a very powerful tool of people being able to to leverage what somebody was going to do and change what they need them to do. So I have another story, a quick one, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a friend, and I'm not going to use his name, uh, who he he was tattooed from head to toe before that was like a normal thing, right? <laughs> so like right. when I was when I was when I was bouncing, it was like if you were that tattooed, you were in a gang or a sailor or a military, and now it's like if you're that tattooed, you're going to tell about your vegan bicycle or whatever. It's just <laughs> it's a big it's a it, big switch, is what I'm yeah, trying to say. Yeah, there's been a it. shift. There's been a there's shift. Been a, yeah. There's been a shift in tattoos in general. Anyways, he's a very successful lawyer. He's tattooed from his collarbone all the way to his wrist to about like uh, midpoint. Mm-hmm. Anyways, what I'm saying is you can't see his tattoos if he's wearing a suit. And he right. did that on purpose so he could still be a lawyer and still be taken seriously. But he is literally tattooed everywhere. Else. Mm-hmm. So when we used to go to the club, he would meet women. And again, this is before, you know, mustache wax type of uh, tattoos. This was like hardcore that man's dangerous tattoos. Mm -hmm. A lot of women were put off by his appearance. Sure. And he was physically fit. He was a decent looking dude, very intelligent, is a lawyer, Um, very like crazy successful. So he's a clever fella. Uh, But his his move to meet women was typecasting. So he would Mm -hmm. say like, he'd walk up, be like, hey, you want to buy your drink? Standard before like you could swipe left or right. You had to talk Mm -hmm. to people. And uh, so- Uh, Back in the day. (laughs) (laughs) So he'd walk up to them at the bar and be like, hey, can I buy you a drink? And if the woman said no, he'd be like, why? She's like, well, you know, I don't really like blah, 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 blah. And he'd be like, oh, weird. I just, I didn't peg you like all the other girls. I thought like, you know, you'd be a little bit more open-minded. Yeah, to uh-huh. And then they'd be like, oh, well, I am not like the other girls. And that's, that's a typecasting hook move, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a basic example. Same thing a boss might do, right? Like, hey, do you want to work late, Sally? Uh, no, I have my kids tonight. Oh, 
I thought you wanted that promotion, but I guess you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So that's that hook to drag you into, to violate those boundaries. So you need to understand, number one, your physical space is very important. And the only good thing that came out of COVID was people actually understand physical distancing now. Like they know what six Maybe. feet is. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the point of the world, I guess right. you're right. Yeah. Here at least, and I always say Alberta is the Texas of Canada, and we are very similarly based <laughs> in, the, in the thought process Texas has versus here. But sure. a lot of people, if when I used to say like, stay about an arm's reach away, they didn't know that. But now a lot of people mm -hmm. have it intrinsically. Mm -hmm. So you need, to, you need to control your physical space, know what your body language is showing. Do you look submissive, do you look whatever, dominant? Then you need to understand that all of your boundaries in a healthy exchange are going to be done verbally all of them. Mm -hmm. So even if it's a physical boundary and a healthy exchange, I'm going to be like, I'm not going to be like, hug me and see what happens. And even if I did, that's still a verbal boundary, right? Like mm -hmm. that's me enforcing it. So having all that in mind that the emotional boundary will push you through that. So this lady in the story, she didn't want to date tattoo people. That was her boundary. He breached that boundary by getting her emotionally invested in who she was as a person. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is a common tactic. You'll see it. And I'm sure depending on what side your listeners are on, you see it on both sides of the fence, right and left of people using this exact tactic. If you're not like us, you are the enemy kind of situation. Right. 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 So I think when you're what, how do we learn how to do these? It, it's practice. It's time. But you need to understand that it's going to take work. And the thing that I really need people to understand, and I might be jumping ahead here, but it fits organically, is uh, once, if you didn't set boundaries originally and you start to set boundaries, those boundaries, you get challenged more than any other boundary you have. If you decide to change who you are. So let's say, for example, you take my course or a course similar to this, or you read a, a, the book boundaries, I forget the guy's name, but I highly recommend it. Um, if you, you do this and you're like, you know what? I want stronger boundaries. So I don't have strong boundaries and I want to start enforcing these. I've had three clients go through this exact same thing. So they were like, we love the class. Let's do this. I want to start forcing boundaries. My mother-in-law, my sister, my mm -hmm. daughter. If you were a person that was maybe a little bit walk over -y before and you change suddenly, that's going to send a ripple through your entire culture. Sure. Yeah. Through every yeah. person you talk to. So they're going to number one, check if everything's okay. But number two, they think they've already won the negotiation, right? I know mm -hmm. how you act. You know how I act. This is what I expect, right? When that changes, there's going to be friction. There's just mm -hmm. no way around that. So if you're looking to increase your boundaries, you're trying to get better at boundary setting, realize it's not going to be like set it and forget it. It's going to be constantly reinforced. So you need to, when you're setting your boundary, express your boundary, really make sure they know it's serious. You need to consistently have that boundary. It can't be flip floppy, right? So if We've all started and stopped working out a gajillion times, right? We've all done that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna get in shape. And then you stop getting in shape. And then when you say you want to get in shape again, what does everybody say? Well, I don't know. You've done this before. It's because you haven't shown consistency in what you said you were going to do. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens with boundaries. If your boundaries for one person, for somebody else, and there isn't a reason why, people are going to challenge that. So the easy part of this, and I know it sounds crazy, the easy part is figuring your boundaries out. The hard part is having the bandwidth or the mental energy to constantly reinforce this to change other people's behavior. That's where people fall flat on this. So I want to be more assertive. When they go somewhere and be assertive, it doesn't quite work. They don't reinforce it. Then they get offended. But I set a boundary, Randy. I thought once I set a boundary, I'm like, no, that's not how this works at all. You have to reinforce this boundary. And that's where people fall off the wagon on this is you got to figure your boundaries out. How do you want to be touched? How do you want to be spoken to? How do you want to feel in general? How can you make that as consistent as possible? Is, are these realistic expectations, right? Like if you're a coal miner and you haven't done anything to become an executive and you're like, I should be treated like an executive, that's an unrealistic boundary. It's just unrealistic. Sure. You can change your life and do all the classes to do that. But you can't, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And you also have to remember once they're set, so how you want to feel say, uh, emotionally, how you want to feel, how you want to be spoken to, how you want to be physically interacted with. Once those are set, they have to be constantly checked, constantly reinforced. You don't build a wall and leave it alone. You put guards on the wall to make sure people aren't climbing over it, right? So you have to make sure this is reinforced and you have to make sure your enforcement is something you can do, right? So you can't be like, don't touch me or I'm going to snap your neck if you're... 180 pounds lighter than the person you're dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. So they need to be realistic expectations and realistic enforcement.
Gotcha. All right. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I've, I've learned a lot here from you, buddy. I really have. Um, awesome. so yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting here like, man, I, I, I think I'm like getting, be, becoming a better person here. So, um, <laughs> okay. uh, I know you have millions of stories about your boundaries being violated. So yeah. I'm going to remind you once again, this is a family show. Right. So, uh, tell us about a time where you had some sort of sort of like boundary violated and how you responded to that situation. Try and think of a new one. Okay. So this, cause boundary violations happen every single day, right? Oh, yeah, you, know, yeah, yeah. You, you turn your signal on to get parking and somebody goes in there, you, whatever else. So what is a boundary violation? So I mentioned the one with the verbal, I mentioned the physical one already. What's an emotional boundary that may have been violated? I think I already gave you most of my good stories on boundary violations. Uh, I think let's, let's look at, so we'll go back to my bouncing career. Uh, let's look at it another way. Let's look at it as me violating somebody else's boundaries by accident. How about okay. that? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, that's good. So I'm actually, uh, I, I sound very woke when I speak. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't start, I didn't start this way. I, 100%. All of this has been learned through uh, blood and humiliation and trial and error. So yeah, trial and error. Yeah. So I have, I have done, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes when it comes to stuff. So this is actually a really personal one. Um, I was up north teaching, and I actually have a, a full video of this. If you want to link it, I'll send it to you. Okay. I have a full video confession of this, where uh, I actually, right after it happened, I talk on camera. I actually cry. I was really, really emotional about it. So uh, I work with a lot of First Nations here in Alberta. Mm -hmm. And I was up north and I was working with a, a group. And so I made mistake number one. I picked which person was going to be my demo partner. I told them they were going to be the demo partner. I didn't ask who wanted to be the demo partner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I grabbed a guy. He was a very large fellow. He's bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He was younger than me. He just looked like a very dominant male. And this is where my biases kicked in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought he'd be tough enough to handle it. And I made a huge mistake. So anyways, I was this person all day. He was complying. He didn't really resist. He didn't really, you know, he was, he was a really good demo partner. Uh, and then at the end of the seminar, we were doing groundwork. And so I was like, okay, we're going to talk about being on the ground, hands pinned, person between your legs, person on top, person's behind you, all these very common positions that could happen in the sexual assault. And he was like, I don't know if I want to do this one. And he said, because I, uh, I don't want to be like on top of one of the ladies for the demo. And I was like, that's cool. You could get on top of me then. And what I should have heard was, I don't want to do this. And this yeah. is an excuse, not, mm -hmm. not the standard male. Oh, I'll fix your problem by switching out who you're doing it. With. Mm -hmm. So switch it out. We'll put him on top of me, demoed it. And as you're on top of me, like going through it in my head now, I could see he was uncomfortable, but I assumed he was uncomfortable because like, you know, some dude doesn't know he's on top of them. He's sure, and that is uncomfortable. I've been there. Uh, that is yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, it is. So I, again, just kind of pushed it off the side, expected he would say something, which he did kind of already, but uh, assuming he would say something. Um, and then we went to the position that he, it was the end of class. He was very polite. He got to, and he just left. Hmm. And normally, like not to toot my own horn, but people usually want to hang out with me after. They usually sure. like it. They had fun. They're like, Randy, let's do this. Let's do that. I have questions. I tell stories. It's kind of like part of the whole experience. Mm -hmm. And so he left. He just was ghost and gone. So mm -hmm. I drove back to Edmonton. It was like an 11 hour drive because Alber Alberta's nuts big. Like, I can't tell you how, oh, how yeah. high Alberta yeah. is. Yeah. So it's, it's a big place. And so I drove back and I was listening to the audiobooks or whatever. And I get back and uh, I was out of reception area. And so I drive through the city, I get a, a text from the person that I was subcontracting through. And she was like, Did you do this, this, and this with this guy? I was like, Yeah. And she's like, Oh, okay. Well, you can't do that. And I was like, why can't I do that? She's like, well, uh, so long story short, I won't go over the, the whole thing. Number one, one of the reasons he did everything I said was because I was the white person that was hired to educate. Uh, and so he just deferred to me. And this was something I wasn't aware of at the time. Because sure, okay. I don't, I'm not saying I don't see color. That's stupid. But right. I, I definitely don't see, because yes, I, I'm white. And I understand that in my head, white privilege just means my life wasn't harder because of my skin color, but I've had a very hard life in general. So I tend to, and I grew up with um, First Nations people. That's where I lived. We were very, we were low income and a lot of other low income people were there. I was the only white kid in my neighborhood. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying like, I, I deserve to think like this, but that was the bias that I had. Sure. Number two, fun fact, the position that I put him in was the exact position he walked in on while his father murdered his sister. Oh. Uh. 
So I triggered this guy so very hard. Number one, white person like what to do does not great. Number two, I literally forced him to reenact a traumatic experience mm. all because he was a bigger, younger male than me. And I thought he could take it. Right. So we have boundary violations across the board here. Number one, boundary violation, physical. He didn't want to work with me. He didn't want to do that. In fact, I found out later, he was actually a very shy, nice guy. It was um, embarrassed about how physically large he was and he doesn't like mm. attention on him. So I drag him to the middle and put him by the most attention seeking person you've ever <laughs> seen in your entire life. Like, Look at this guy. And of course I'm yeah. doing everything I think I would like. So I'm constantly right. thanking him, using sure. his name. And he's like, hates it. So that's a, that's a physical boundary. That was an emotional boundary. He didn't want to be in the spotlight. I assumed he was going to say something about it forgot about the power imbalance that existed sure. that I wasn't aware of. And then of course we have the verbal boundary of, he already said he didn't want to do it. Yeah. He did it in a way that was confusing for sure, but I should have sussed out the actual intention of the objection. I mm -hmm. shouldn't have just tried to fix the objection. Right. We talk about this all the time, but like, you know, when you're arguing with or your wife's venting and you're like, you know, we men usually, traditionally men, not all guys, calm down, but traditionally men uh, like to just fix a problem right. and women just yes. want to talk about the problem, yep. right? So yep. so I ask, I ask my fiance all the time when she's talking, I'm like, okay, is this, am I listening or am I fixing? What do you need to mm -hmm. hear, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I do that too. I, I get it. <laughs> yeah. So I should have listened to that. So that's the time I extremely violated somebody's boundaries, mm -hmm. uh, all, all three of them. And it was, it was horrible. And so I did a very candid... Uh, video of this after I just, as soon as I got the text, I got on to tell other instructors the, the mistakes that I made. So hopefully they don't make the same ones. Very good. Very good. And it's, it's good to be that aware because, you know, you're obviously a person who didn't want to put him in no. that situation <laughs> yeah, and exactly. you learned from it and you know what, you're, you're, you're going to be a better instructor for it. Um, yeah. But the biggest thing was the bias. Like I yeah. would have never, I would have never done that to a female. Right. Like at that sure. time, at that sure. time, I would have, yeah. I would have listened to every word, but I had this bias that because he's a dude, these rules don't apply. And if your listeners take anything from this, the rules apply to everybody. Every yeah. single person wants to maintain their own personal boundary. It doesn't matter if they're bigger, stronger, tougher, younger. They have a teardrop tattoo on their face. You think they can handle it? Maybe they can. Got it, man. You know, you have really broadened my horizons here today. I really haven't thought a lot about boundaries and what you've said has really resonated with me. And I'm going to take what we've talked about today and I'm going to work on it personally. So if nothing else, awesome. you have, you've helped me personally today. So I appreciate that. One um, person at a time. That's the plan. One there person you go, at a time. Man. One at a time. So Randy, <laughs> you know, I know people are going to want to know more about you. Where can they find out more information on you? So uh, I always make the joke, I love my name. So at Randy King Live is most of my social media. I'm, I'm only on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to join Facebook, I have a Facebook group called the Randy King Live Community. Uh, as we go further into this, I'm really starting this 80-20s thing. We're really this 80-20 conflict management strategy company. We are releasing a course on boundary setting, ideally July 1st. So if this Very interests good. you and you want more education on it, uh, Andy did a preview of it. He kind of saw- mm -hmm. I did, and teaching. it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did, okay, so hopefully it was helpful. Uh, we're going to be working with that. So it's going to be like a full kind of six, seven hour deal, uh, just like my reality of violence course was. Uh, I'm really going to work this out in, I think, a really digestible way. One of the cool things about uh, this is I'm just a goon gone good that likes to read. Like I didn't, I don't have higher education. I just have high school. Uh, I do like to read and I do like to research and stuff. And I do think I'm pretty aware. And I work with a very, very diverse client base. Like I can't stress how diverse, like everybody's like, get a niche. I'm like, I can't, it doesn't work. So I'll work with anybody that wants to work with me, but this boundary setting course, I think will be helpful, especially if you don't really know what they are or if you just want to increase them because uh, I have a bunch of samples of clients that use this. We have a real life on my Patreon. Oh, I would love you to come to patreon.com where I do all of my online classes and presentations, education stuff. Uh, I have one on there right now where one of my clients actually sent me screen caps of a text conversation she had setting boundaries. And she, it was so crazy. This is one of the things people need to know is you're probably doing it right, but because I'm the expert that teaches boundary setting, you're going to check. And so what she did was she sent me screen caps and she was like, uh, what could I have done better here? And the answer was nothing. She nailed it. She Good. could have taught the course. It was perfect. So we all have a lot of stuff like that. I'm really excited to get um, this stuff out there. I think 
These are the holes in the game for self-defense. You definitely need to learn all the other stuff, situational awareness, kicking and punching, uh, weapon skills, driving skills, first aid, because self-defense is holistic, right? It's not mm -hmm. just like key odds, everything, right? right? Have a right. good lawyer, make sure your insurance is up to date, all that kind of stuff. Um, but this is, to me, this is the whole of my game. And I don't know if it's sample size error. I don't know if it's a bias, but literally every time I talk with a client over the last two years, why I'm making the course um, is almost everything started as a boundary issue before it became a self-defense problem. Very cool, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being on the show again, buddy. No problem. Anytime. I love it. Thanks, Andy.